All right, so welcome to this week's virtual journal club with the journal physiology. My name is Jennifer Williams and I'm a PhD candidate at McMaster University here in Canada, studying under the supervision of Dr. Maureen McDonald. I'll be your host today for today's journal club session and it's my great pleasure to welcome the following panelists as authors of the paper lifelong voluntary aerobic exercise prevents age and western diet induced vascular dysfunction mitochondrial oxidative stress and inflammation in mice, which was published in late 2020 in the journal. So first off, we have Dr. Zachary Clayton, a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Colorado Boulder. Next, we have Melanie Zeigler, uh, a senior professional research assistant and lab manager at the University of Colorado Boulder as well. And finally, we have Dr. Douglas Seals, a distinguished professor and principal investigator of the in Integrative Physiology of Aging Laboratory at the University of Colorado Boulder. So for logistics, before we get started, I wanted to share how today's session will run. In a moment, I will pass off the floor to our panelists to provide an overview of the paper and its findings, followed by the biomedical significance and extensions to this work. After this, we will enter into a question and answer period where we would like to hear from you. So please use the Q&A function in Zoom, you can see it at the bottom of your screen, to submit any questions that you have throughout today's session, and we'll look forward to a lively discussion with you. A quick note about the Q&A, you can submit questions anonymously, or you can submit them with your name and your institution or organization where you're joining us from. You can also upvote any questions from other attendees that you want to see answered. Finally, this webinar portion of today's session will be recorded and it will be emailed to you within the next week. After the Q&A session, we'll also have an opportunity to enter into approximately a 30 minute networking session where we encourage you to discuss and you can reflect with other attendees and panelists. We'll post a link in the chat on Zoom at the end of the session for you to join our networking session. So to get us started today, I wanted to share why I chose, the, chose this paper for the journal club. So first, as a vascular researcher, I came across this article when reading about aging induced decrements in vascular outcomes and factors that exacerbate or attenuate this response. And this was the first trial that I had come across that really examined these intersections of aging, lifelong exercise and diet on vascular uh, outcomes using such an elegant design uh, with examining some of the measures cross-sectionally and others longitudinally to really de determine the temporal relationship between these factors. I also found that the paper, it both reaffirmed some fundamental knowledge that I had learned in my training, while also kind of updating and extending this knowledge beyond just cross-sectional population-based trials or acute trials. So I found that to be particularly novel with this, with this study. In addition to that, I found the connection between the vascular outcomes that we'll learn about today and the underlying mechanisms to paint this full picture of what's happening in the vasculature and noting a pretty compelling argument for the importance of lifelong exercise in preventing both age and Western diet induced decrements in vascular outcomes. Now, when it comes to a journal club, uh, what's really important when choosing an article is to note how big this trial was. It had many moving pieces and we're gonna learn about much data and future directions um, that I find is uh, you know, really great for us to be discussing in a journal club. So it was a prime selection for today's discussion. So with that introduction, I'll now pass the floor to Dr. Clayton to discuss more about the paper and we'll follow up with a Q&A at the end of the session. So take it away, Dr. Clayton. Sorry, just let me get this figured out. Okay, you seeing that okay? I can see that. All right, wonderful. Uh, Jennifer, first of all, thank you for inviting us and thank you to the Journal of Physiology for this um, great opportunity to share our work. So yeah, this is the title of the paper from the journal. Um, but before I get started, I, I wanna specifically highlight Dr. Rachel Josh Ryan, who is current, a current medical resident um, pursuing anesthesiology at the University of Michigan. And she was, she's the primary uh, co-first author on this paper and was very integral in executing all the experiments conducted here. So I wouldn't be able to give this presentation if it wasn't for her. So um, thank you, Rachel. So as some of you may know, uh, cardiovascular diseases are the leading cause of death in the developed world and developing nations. And aging is by and large the primary risk factor for the development of cardiovascular diseases. As you can see the stepwise progression in cardiovascular disease, 
with advancing age here on the x-axis. And a key antecedent to cardiovascular aging are processes that we refer to as arterial dysfunction. And two main manifestations of arterial dysfunction are vascular endothelial dysfunction and arterial stiffness, both of which I will uh, give more detail on here. So first we'll start with endothelial dysfunction. And before we get into that, it's important to understand what is the endothelium. And it's the innermost layer of a blood vessel. And it's a single cell layer that we refer to as the endothelium. And the endothelium, uh, when stimulated with various chemical stimuli as well as mechanical stimuli, can produce the molecule nitric oxide. So some of you, um, or many of you have likely heard of this compound as it's the primary compound for vasodilation. And the way that works is it's a gas, so it freely diffuses from the endothelium into the vascular smooth muscle, where it causes vascular smooth muscle relaxation and ultimately vasodilation. And reduced nitric oxide bioavailability has been shown to be the primary mechanism by which aging leads to vascular endothelial dysfunction. And this process, uh, when, when nitric oxide bioavailability is reduced, it can increase the risk for cardiovascular diseases such as atherosclerosis, hypertension, and stroke. So as it relates to the paper, it's important to understand how we measure this in our animal model. And as I mentioned, the nitric oxide can be stimulated by chemical means. So the way we do this initially is we isolate carotid arteries from mice and we pressurize them and tie them to fine glass cannula and then we can stimulate nitric oxide production and ultimately vasodilation by providing the chemical compound acetylcholine, which stimulates nitric oxide production from the endothelium. And notably, this is our mouse corollary to the gold standard measure of measuring endothelial function in humans, flow-mediated dilation. And this ex vivo technique allows us not only to look at endothelial function, which uh, for the sake of this paper and the future data presentation slides, referred to as peak endothelium dependent dilation or peak EDD, but we can also add various compounds, uh, whether those are activators or inhibitors to the bath, the physiological bath in which these vessels are housed in order to what we call pharmacodissect out various signaling pathways. Next, uh, the stiffening of the large elastic arteries or arterial stiffness occurs with advancing age. And what, what happens is we have reduced elasticity and reduced distensibility of the large elastic arteries. And for the sake of this paper, we focused on the large elastic artery, the aorta. And what this ends up resulting in is a decreased um, ability to dampen pulsatile flow. So that results in higher pulse pressures reaching end organs, such as the heart, which can also ultimately damage the fine microvascular, microvasculature of the heart and lead to cardiovascular diseases. So as it relates to this paper and other studies in our laboratory, we assess large elastic artery stiffness in vivo in mice uh, using aortic pulse wave velocity where we can uh, trace the aortic arch to the abdominal aorta. And notably, this is our mouse corollary to the gold standard measure carotid femoral pulse wave velocity in humans. And notably, two macro mechanistic processes that lead to arterial aging our excess oxidative stress, which is largely um, induced by excess superoxide and inflammation, which are symbiotic and mutually reinforcing. So these serve as viable upstream targets to try to understand how an intervention is mechanistically regulating arterial dysfunction. And these processes when exacerbated can reduce the bioavailability of nitric oxide. So that leads us to the purpose of this study. But before I get into that, I'll stat, um, note specific findings from our laboratory that preceded this study, which provide further rationale. So as I mentioned, aging leads to reduced nitric oxide bioavailability and arterial dysfunction and oxidative stress or in the form of superoxide is a key upstream mechanism. And our laboratory has previously identified that mitochondria, vascular mitochondria are a key source of that excess superoxide. We've also shown that late life exercise interventions can reduce mitochondrial oxidative stress and increase nitric oxide bioavailability. And that late life exposure of a Western diet, and for the sake of our study, this, is, this diet is defined as a high sugar, high fat diet. This can accelerate the aging process in late life. And that late life voluntary aerobic exercise um, as modeled by voluntary wheel running can attenuate or prevent this response. 
However, we aimed in this study to first identify whether or not consuming a Western diet throughout the lifespan would accelerate the vascular aging process and whether or not lifelong aerobic exercise could prevent primary aging. So that's aging in the setting of a healthy normal chow diet or aging in the setting of a Western diet. So to accomplish this, this was our study design. We studied mice at terminal time points of six months, 13, 19, and 27 months. And we had four different groups. So the first two is a normal chow or Western diet. And this is what we're referring to as normal chow and Western diet sedentary, or the two diet groups with provision of a voluntary wheel running apparatus to look at the effect of aerobic exercise. <clears throat> and we had those four groups across all time points. And notably, the Western diet reduced lifespan, so we do not have terminal measurements at 27 months in the Western diet group. And animals were assigned to groups at three months of age. And here's a, there's a figure taken from the, the paper just to give you an overarching look at what we did. And as Jennifer mentioned, there was some longitudinal measures and some terminal measures. And because aortic pulse wave velocity is assessed in vivo, that allowed us to leverage the elegance of that technique by doing longitudinal measures with the various groups. So aortic stiffness is our aortic pulse wave velocity. And then at terminal time points, we assess endothelial function, intrinsic mechanical stiffness of the aorta, which I will talk about in further slides, uh, vascular oxidative stress and inflammation. Again, as those are key macro mechanistic processes that lead to vascular aging. So first, uh, I'll just, before I pull up a figure, I'll just let you know these, as if you've seen in the paper, there are a lot of groups and there are a lot of bars. So I will provide broad overarching uh, descriptions of patterns that we see rather than going bar by bar. So as not to um, drown the audience with too much detail. So for quick context, gray, uh, solid gray is the primary aging. So that's sedentary mice consuming a normal chow. Then you have Western diet sedentary and the solid gold and then the respective colors with stripes would include voluntary wheel running. So this is peak EDD. So this is our primary outcome for endothelial function. And if you look at the gray bars, you can see this pattern of decline throughout the lifespan. And then, so we see this primary aging phenotype. And then we see that the West mice consuming Western diet without access to voluntary wheel running have accelerated endothelial dysfunction and that there's a remarkable protective effect of aerobic exercise independent of diet. So this is endothelial function with in response to acetylcholine. So to look at the role of smooth muscle, we then provided an exogenous nitric oxide donor, sodium nitroprusside, to look at smooth muscle function. And we saw no group differences. So this suggested to us that the differences were endothelial specific. Then to look at the effect of nitric oxide, we then put in the vessel bath the compound L name, which blocks the production of nitric oxide, which you can see the peak response is lower, but the group differences remain. So this suggests to us that the changes that we observed in endothelial function were nitric oxide mediated. Next for arterial stiffness, again, this, this measurement was our longitudinal measurement in vivo. And we assessed the mice at baseline and then approximately every six months for the rest of their life. And then you can see in the solid gray bars, there's this pattern of increase, which we would have expected to see because age-related increases in arterial stiffness is well established. But we saw an accelerated phenotype um, with the Western diet sedentary group. And again, a protective effect in, these in the later time points with or across, across the lifespan with voluntary aerobic exercise. Again, showing the remarkable effects of uh, voluntary aerobic exercise on the aging vasculature. So next is the intrinsic mechanical stiffness of the aorta, which I mentioned previously. And this is our way to start to mechanistically look at how the aorta stiffness is changing independent of neuronal tone or humoral factors. And what we do is we load isolated aorta rings about one to two millimeters in length onto a wire myograph and perform stress strain testing, which allows us to produce elastic moduli uh, curves or Young's modulus is another common way to refer to that. And what we found here is again, just describing patterns is we have this increase with primary aging in the gray and this accelerated phenotype with Western diet sedentary animals and this protective effect of aerobic exercise independent of diet. 
Next, to start to understand the mechanisms by which this is occurring, we utilized uh, the technique called electron paramagnetic resonance spectroscopy, which is referred to as the gold standard for assessing oxidative stress in tissues. First, we looked at whole cell superoxide production. And you can see that there, again, we have the, um, this aging phenotype in the gray bars, this accelerated aging phenotype with the Western diet sedentary group and a protective effect of aerobic exercise. But notably, this is overall superoxide production and our hypothesis was mitochondrial focus. So now that we have a overall superoxide phenotype, we then perform this assay using a mitochondrial specific spin probe, which, allowed, which is a bioassay for assessing mitochondrial oxidative stress in the vasculature. And notably, this was done in isolated aorta rings. I apologize if I didn't say that. And we see a similar, um, but also exaggerated phenotype with the mitochondrial specific spin probe. So suggesting to us that the Western diet is accelerating vascular aging by increasing um, mitochondrial oxidative stress. Then as a next step to functionally test the role of mitochondrial oxidative stress in regulating uh, arterial function, we repeated those acetylcholine uh, PKDD assays with isolated carotid arteries, but in the presence of the mitochondrial targeted antioxidant MitoQ. So this would scavenge any excess mitochondrial oxidative stress. So what you see here, if you focus on the, <clears throat> at the each time point, the mitochondrial group, the, mito, the MitoQ groups, is that the group differences are ameliorated and function is brought back to levels of the young, healthy animals. So this would suggest to us that uh, one, primary aging is, vascular aging is occurring as a result of excess mitochondrial oxidative stress and Western diet is accelerating the vascular aging phenotype through mitochondrial oxidative stress. And that is also the a uh, viable therapeutic target uh, for voluntary aerobic exercise. And lastly, we assessed vascular inflammation using a multiplex ELISA platform. And this was done in aorta lysates and across primary um, typical uh, candidates for pro-inflammatory signaling, interleukin-1 beta, interleukin-6, interferon gamma, and tumor necrosis factor alpha, we see that general pattern that we were observing with our functional assays with this increase with primary aging, accelerated aging with the Western diet and a protective effect uh, in the exercising groups. So taken together, we see that primary aging increases mitochondrial oxidative stress and inflammation which results in large elastic artery stiffening and endothelial dysfunction um, as a result of reduced nitric oxide bioavailability. And we know this increases the risk for the development of cardiovascular disease. And this process is accelerated with consumption of a lifelong Western diet, but that voluntary aerobic exercise has a protective effect on the primary aging vasculature, as well as the aging vasculature in the setting of a Western diet. So thank you very much for your attention uh, to the original research data and some of the conclusions. Uh, now I will turn it over to my colleague, Melanie Ziegler for practical considerations. Okay, thanks Zach. So um, Zach showed kind of what we ended up with, but how did we get to that point? And I'm just gonna talk about a little of the behind the scenes stuff that um, people might be interested in if you haven't had experience with this type of study design, which we certainly didn't have before we started. So it was a learning experience for us. Um, as we started to plan out the study, one of the first things that we realized we needed to know was how long the mice on the Western diet were going to live so that we could choose when um, to set those terminal measurement time points. And so through the literature, we knew that their lifespan would likely be reduced, but we didn't know by how much. And so ultimately we decided to do a small pilot study um, and put a group of mice on the diet and just track them and see how long they survived. Um, ultimately, we found that about 50% of them were still alive around the 18 to 19 month time point. So um, we chose that as one of our terminal measure time points so that we knew we'd have enough mice left to study. Um, and it also corresponds to the 27 month time point in the uh, normal chow mice, which is when about 50% of those mice are still alive. 
Um, so once we determined our terminal sacrifice time points, uh, we needed to figure out how often we could make those pulse wave velocity measurements in vivo, um, both from a just practical standpoint of what's feasible, um, and then also from a scientific standpoint of um, you know, what will give us the best curve of what's happening throughout the lifespan, as well as in order to collect that measure, the mice are under light anesthesia, and we didn't want to uh, stress them by putting them under anesthesia too often or um, have effects of that repeated anesthesia on vascular function later on. So ultimately through the literature and discussions, we decided on the, about every six months for collecting that data. Um, so now we know when we're going to make the terminal measures, when we're going to make the um, in vivo measurements. And then the next choice was, do we start all of the mice from all of those 16 groups at the same time um, and then sacrifice them as the age of the terminal time point comes up? or uh, the route that we decided to go was to start the oldest mice first and then wait a few months and then start the next group. And the reason we chose that approach was it allowed us to sacrifice all of the terminal mice around the same period of time. Um, so that meant that tissues that we were saving for those later biochemical analyses were all collected within a similar time frame, as opposed to um, the, first approach of starting all the mice at the same time point, and then you have stuff sitting in the freezer for years uh, longer than the other older mice while you're waiting. Um, it also allowed us to make sure that all of our solutions that we use in our in vivo measurements came from the same lot of chemicals and all of those things just maintaining consistency. Um, so we uh, selected all of our approaches and then Rachel and I sat down with a three-year calendar and a bunch of colored pens and we just wrote out we start this group on this day and they're ready to study you know two years from now and these are all the intermediary, intermediary time points that we need to make measurements at um, and it really was you know pen and paper color coding all of that stuff to keep everything organized um, and then Zach, we can go to the next time point. Um, so we had it all written out and it was overwhelming. And so we knew that we needed to use kind of a divide and conquer approach. And so what we did is uh, those uh, pulse, repeated pulse wave velocity, velocity measurements, we divided up among some of the other co-authors on the paper and they would follow the same group group of mice throughout the lifespan so that one person wasn't having to make 200 pulse wave velocity measurements um, each month. So we you know, divided and conquered and tried to maintain consistency as best as possible. Um, but even with all the best laid plans, you order a group of mice and you're ready to start them on their intervention and they're young males and they all start fighting. And then you start over with a new group of mice. So. Um, we tried to plan as much as possible, but as with anything in science, things came up throughout the process that made us, you know, have to uh, pivot, as people like to say now. So um, that's kind of what I have for now, and I'm happy to answer more questions during the Q&A, but I'll pass it on to Dr. Seals to talk about the uh, biomedical significance. Thanks, Melanie. Hi, everybody. Uh, I just have a few comments that I'd like to um, emphasize before we wrap things up and go to the general Q&A. Um, one of the things that I wanted to impress upon the trainees watching this presentation is um, how to choose models and experimental approaches uh, when it comes to trying to address physiological questions of interest to you. In this case, uh, I'll emphasize the value of mouse models in the context of the study that we're discussing today. Uh, we started off strictly studying human subjects and we still have the investigation of phenomena, uh, physiological phenomena in humans as our primary goal. But what I wanna emphasize here is the importance of flexibility 
in considering what the best experimental approach is to answering the question uh, that you're interested in. So in this context, as Melanie and Zach said, we needed to be able to follow some type of subject over an entire lifespan. Obviously, that's not going to happen in humans. So the mouse model became the best experimental approach for the question, which required us to assess temporal changes in physiological function, in, in this case, vascular function, across the entire adult lifespan to isolate uh, what Zach uh, referred to as primary aging. We also wanted to look at the long-term effects of exposure to common, what I'll call environmental factors. In this case, obviously, consumption of different diets, including the Western diet, and the presence or absence of regular aerobic exercise, voluntary aerobic exercise. And again, this is not something that we can study uh, with really strong experimental control in human populations. So again, the mouse model allowed us not only to look at changes in vascular function across the lifespan, but also to uh, expose those animals to differing background diets and, and levels of physical activity. Another real advantage of using the mouse model in the context of the present study was that we really could interrogate mechanisms that uh, Zach was talking about earlier that are responsible, that explain either the changes in vascular function across the lifespan under standard diet conditions, and then also the modulatory effects of those two primary exposures, Western diet and regular aerobic exercise. And, and Zach mentioned pharmacodissection. We can take isolated vessels, as he described, and we can block various signaling pathways. We can do some of that in human models, but it's much more difficult. And to do it in any way near what we've done here in the mice, we would have had to use an invasive model in humans where we cannulate the brachial artery and infuse vasoactive compounds and signaling uh, pathway inhibitors and activators into the brachial artery. And that this is a, a very um, you know, risky uh, uh, procedure, especially in older adults. So it, it, it was much more straightforward to do it in mice. Zach also mentioned our ability to study the intrinsic properties of tissues, in this case, the mechanical stiffness of the aorta to let us uh, give us greater insight into how changes in the composition of the arterial wall was contributing to the events that we saw when we studied uh, these across the lifespan. That was facilitated greatly uh, by the mouse model. We couldn't have done it in people. And then lastly, uh, Melanie mentioned this a bit, but the biochemistry of tissue. So being able to assess markers of inflammation, being able to measure reactive oxygen species production in arteries, uh, these require one to extract arteries out of the subject and be able to study them uh, obviously something else that we could not have possibly done in, in humans. So the overarching point again here is, you know, even though you may be working in cell culture or in people or whatever, the case is uh, always think about the best possible approach, the most definitive approach uh, that you can take to answering the questions that you're interested in. And then just as a, as a final, I think this is the final one, is it Zach? Uh, or do I have one more? But anyway. No, one more, which is a take home message. Yeah, the, the, the point here is that, again, the mouse model allowed us to investigate the interactions uh, between primary aging processes and exposure to lifelong 
uh, Western diet and regular aerobic exercise. Again, the mouse model was perfect uh, for us in this context. So the broad uh, take home message is uh, what, I've, what I've tried to lead up to to this point, which is as early career stage investigators, it's important for you to first establish the questions you're attempting to answer. And then having done so, identify the most effective research model and experimental approaches available to most definitively answer the questions that you pose. Uh, so th that's that's one of the take homes from the uh, discussion today. And thanks so much for joining us. All right. So with that, really would like to thank Dr. Douglas Seal, Melanie Ziegler, and uh, Dr. Zer uh, Zachary Clayton for comprehensive presentation, highlighting those central findings, really elegant decisions that you had to make with the challenging planning, which I'd love to get into a bit. Um, and the advice for early researchers in developing trials. Um, so I'm gonna now turn the floor to questions that folks have. Uh, so if you're attending and have a question, just go down to the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen and I'll select questions that come along for our panelists uh, to answer kind of in the next 15 minutes or so before we head off to our networking session. Um, so while those questions roll in, I do have lots of questions um, for myself and my research group, um, but we'll jump into the results first. So you highlighted in your presentation, and it's in figure two for those of you who prefer to print out and read through a study. Um, really fascinated to see those similar peak endothelial dependent dilation or EDD and the nitric oxide mediated dilation. Both voluntary running groups had that um, kind of amelioration of um, the Western diet and aging related decrements. I was really curious to see that in the normal diet sedentary group though, not really changes in aging across six, 13 and 19 months, but then all of a sudden at 27 months, there's this decrease in function. Could you speak to us a little bit about what you think is happening between 19 months and 27 month time points? Is this an aging based tipping point where some of those mechanisms now you know, supersede any uh, antioxidant benefits that are happening in the vasculature? I'd love to know a little bit more about that. Go ahead, Zach. I'll kick us off. So important to note is how the mouse lifespan relates to humans. And in the C57 Black 6 model, the 18 month time point is commonly referred to as, as middle age. So 19 months is relatively close to that. If we look at any aging, longitudinal aging trajectories in humans, we can see increased cardiovascular disease risk start to exponentially increase around mid midlife. So it's that extrapolation and that translation to humans why we think is what's going on there. Because we do see a reduction at that 19 month time point, but not significantly reduced where we do see significant reduction in endothelium dependent dilation at 27 months. So Jennifer, I think you nailed it, that there is a tipping point and we don't have hormonal profiles on these animals, obviously. Um, however, we do think that it's, it's that middle age phenomena at that in humans, the transition to increase cardiovascular disease risk at middle age is somewhat time dependent. Not everybody falls off or increases cardiovascular disease risk at the same time. Melanie or Doug, if you want to add anything. Well, I think that's that captures most of it. I'll just add that uh, I I suspect, and based on our data, that some of those cellular mechanisms are uh, being affected by aging at the point, as Jennifer just brought up. For example, oxidative stress keeps increasing. Uh, mitochondrial and whole vascular cell production of reactive oxygen species keeps increasing from that middle age point on. And I think there's, one, there's a point at which the ability of those endothelial cells to upregulate antioxidant defenses in order to counter the increases in mitochondrial loss production and to suppress the further development of oxidative stress, I think those systems may become overwhelmed because we do not see a continued increase in antioxidant defenses as those levels of loss production increase from middle age to old age. And physiologically, that's the exact compensatory effect that one would expect to see uh, 
in response to greater and greater ROS bioactivity. That should stimulate antioxidant defenses to continue to increase their expression, uh, the abundance of those enzymes, and uh, that's not what we see. So there is a dysregulation of homeostatic processes that begin to occur in middle age. And I'll just say from uh, kind of the practical standpoint from some other previous studies that we've done, we don't consistently see endothelial dysfunction in the mice until like after 24 months of age and most consistently around 27 months. Um, and so you start, it's just really variable before that time point. So um, it does seem like it, it changes similar to humans over a period of time um, and not necessarily the same in every mouse. It was neat to see kind of that there was that expectation across all of the outcomes, really, that, you know, you saw the alignment between your endothelial function, your arterial stiffness, and then and then ultimately with some of the underlying mechanisms. Um, I have a great question here coming in from an anonymous attendee um, saying, great paper and really well presented. I agree. Um, do you have any idea regarding the amount of voluntary exercise mice were performing, the volume and intensity, and how this would translate to humans? That would have been my next question as well. So uh, yeah, take it away team. So I, I don't remember the exact number of meters ran throughout the day, but I do know it's it's in the it's in the manuscript if anyone wants to look there. But the point of the thing to, I think the major thing to point out is that running overall running volume reduces with advancing age. But despite that reduction in running volume, we still see that remarkable effect, the remarkable protective effect on the aging vasculature. And when asked this question before in the context of this paper, the best advice I think we can put forward with this is, because, um, is to think about if a mouse has access to a running wheel, it will often use it. So it's, I think it fits in with this incoming narrative that's being um, put forth in the public health space is to reduce sedentary time. And it's ultimately to consistently engage in physical activity because that's what the mice seem to do. So we don't have temporal patterns of exercise or if mice exercise more in the morning or at night or the circadian effects. However, what we, what we do know is that exercise does have a beneficial effect. Um, but this, is, this study did not aim to test exercise intensity or exercise volume as broadly exercise in and of itself. So I, I think the, the take home message here is to try to move often as you can. Yeah. I. I think Zach's point uh, about the, the old mice is, is very interesting and we've observed it for many years now. They run about a, a tenth of what young adult mice run. So the fact that you can, you can block the effects of the aging and exposure to a very adverse environmental factor like Western diet with a tenth of the running wheel distance that you would see in a young adult mouse uh, really illustrates the power of aerobic exercise. Obviously in this model, we can't expand it beyond that, but it, it's pretty remarkable that that seemingly small quantitative stimulus was able to have such robust uh, protective effects on vascular function with advancing age. In terms of the, the question about what the least amount of exercise is, we don't know that. We do know from our studies in people, uh, in addition to what I just said about mice, our, our results in people, we, we exercise people about five days a week. And you could, you could reverse endothelial function in late middle age and older adults by having them walk briskly for about 40 minutes a day, five days a week. Now that's still five days a week and it, it essentially meets the current guidelines for moderate intensity, continuous uh, aerobic exercise. So that is the, you know, that is the recommendation essentially what we've studied in humans. And that does appear to be effective in preserving endothelial function with advancing age in people. How low you can sort of titrate that level down, 
before aging or the effects of Western diet consumption uh, start to uh, not be negated by the physical activity, I think is unknown at this point. Thank you so much for that question. Um, so I'll jump into, I think we have time for maybe two more questions before we jump away. Um, so I'm curious about, actually, we were just talking about extending this work in some future directions. Maybe we could chat about that. I'm curious if you could speculate as to what you think might happen if you put the mice with the Western diet who are sedentary. So at six months, they have that impaired endothelial function. We're starting to see some of those, um, maybe not quite yet, those, well, some, some oxidative stress mechanisms uh, starting there. Um, what would happen if you put those mice onto a voluntary exercise condition? You gave them a running meal. Uh, would you suspect their function would increase? Would it be to the same levels as uh, the the mice that started with a wheel or not, um, yeah. I would I would speculate that there would certainly be a level of reversal in that in that dysfunction, and I th try to think about it from a mechanistic perspective. And I'll follow up on what Dr. Seal said um, maybe two questions ago: is that the the Western diet is increasing oxidative stress, but then if you so they have this buildup of oxidative stress, but then if they start exercising, now you have a means of increasing antioxidant defenses. So it would, the level of which you could recover function remains to be seen. Um, I, I think it would be certainly interesting study to pursue, but from a mechanistic perspective, I think we would view it from that, that elegant balance of pro-oxidative molecules relative to the compensatory or in the context of exercise and upregulation of antioxidant defenses and how that balance then equates to um, endothelial function or arterial stiffness. Yeah, I think there's evidence that you can um, expose at least mice, uh, older mice to adverse stimuli and then have the effects of aging and exposure to those adverse stimuli reversed by access to voluntary um, wheel running in those animals. So I, I would agree with Zach. I think that there would be certainly some mitigation of the vascular dysfunction mediated by the mechanisms that we've been discussing as a result of the addition of physical activity, even after the person or the animal has been exposed to one or more of these adverse factors that we're discussing. That's the, really the power of voluntary aerobic exercise. It's, it's truly remarkable. Melanie, did you want to jump in there? I was going to say basically the same thing, so. Well, maybe I'll, I'll direct this last question uh, to you if you want to uh, start with this one. Um, oh, it looks like we actually got a question in here. So based on what Professor Seal stated in response to the above questions, the earlier one, uh, older mice perform a tenth of the amount of exercise than younger mice. How much protection do you think is due to high volumes of exercise performed in youth compared with elderly? Yeah, really interesting question there, if anybody wants to answer. Um. Yeah, it's a little bit difficult to address because we, as Zach mentioned, we, we cannot, one limitation of the voluntary wheel running uh, experimental approach is that we cannot control the exercise intensity or duration. But what, what we understand from observations historically when you give mice access to running wheels is they, they tend to run in spurts in the high intensity spurts and then rest and then run again. And it's been speculated that most of this occurs uh, because of nocturnal feeding drives. So like innate drive to, to search uh, forage for food. Um, I'm not I'm certainly not a, uh, an expert in that area, but, but what has been observed is this spurting type uh, hard running and that it's almost like interval running as I understand it. And so that does leave the question open, how does that compare to the moderate intensity aerobic exercise 
that we, and I know other people have, have studied high intensity interval exercise, but, but our studies on endothelial dysfunction uh, and aerobic exercise training in people in middle age and older adults have strictly used moderate intensity continuous aerobic exercise. So one of the uh, interesting uh, ideas that, that you could come up with as to why this relatively small exercise volume in these older mice had such a profound cardioprotective effect is that maybe those mice are engaging in essentially the mouse version of high intensity interval training. And that that's the reason why such a small volume of exercise can seemingly have such a profound effect. And maybe, maybe we would see the same thing in older adults. Of course, we need to be uh, mindful of injury risk and, and other things when we apply high intensity interval training, especially running, which was the case in the mice here, to older humans. Uh, so there, there, there are those issues, but in terms of the physiological stimulus, it's quite a fascinating question. And I'd love to see the future directions of what this is going to, you know, that this study is then really opening up a huge field for us to explore both in mouse models and human models. So I think, Melanie, if I can direct the last question to you and then Zachary and Dr. Seals, if you want to jump in. Um, in the conclusion of the paper, you write about how the results could inform uh, potential future strategies for preserving cardiovascular health uh, with aging. Could you elaborate a little bit more on what's next? What is the next future direction for this work, whether it's in your lab or just in general? Well, I think one thing we learned is doing a lifelong study, as I mentioned before, we termed this the lifelong study and originally that referred to lifelong in the mice. And as the study went on and on, we decided maybe it actually referred to our lifetime and that the study would take that period of time. So um, I don't know that we are ready to undertake another lifelong study in, um, like this in mice, but I think you can use those mechanisms that we've identified and the time periods at which you may reach that tipping point to then apply interventions to those pathways. Um, and so, you know, things like giving a mitochondrial antioxidant maybe at midlife before you go down that pathway is one uh, direction you could go or um, other interventions um, that you could apply kind of in that midlife time period. And I'll let other people answer if they have other. Yeah, no, I was just, oh, go, go ahead, ahead, Zach. Go, no, you, go I, ahead. I was just gonna say, I was just gonna say that um, uh, we could perhaps get at the question that was posed earlier in terms of what is the minimal amount of physical activity that could be uh, still protective against vascular aging by locking those running wheels a certain number of days a week. And you could do that, um, you know, and, and do a dose response study in the mice. So let them run two days a week, four days a week, and every day, and see if you could protect the animals. Now, the, the limitation of the mouse model is then how do we, at the end of that six year study, because uh, it probably would turn out to be that. Uh, how do we translate that to people? Uh, that really doesn't help us with all of that effort and time and expense. Uh, how much does that inform exercise guidelines about what the minimal amount of exercise is to protect the vasculature with aging in people? So it would be very interesting from a scientific standpoint uh, and there's a lot of interesting physiology in that type of study design, but how clinically informative it would be, I'm not sure. Uh, just to take the conversation or the answer in a slightly different direction is something that we didn't necessarily talk about within the scientific presentation of this is the antecedent of to which the vascular dysfunction is to other age-related diseases, such as mild cognitive impairment, dementia, uh, chronic kidney disease, um, obviously heart disease. And there's some evidence now that arterial stiffness may predict the development of metabolic dysfunction. So not only does the 
the voluntary exercise improve the aging vasculature in the setting of both diets, but also how does lifelong aerobic exercise, you know, impact these other age-related processes as a result of improving vascular function, I think would be um, a fascinating next step. And I think with that, uh, this will be the end of our formal Q&A period, but I'd like to thank everyone for attending. We're gonna encourage you to continue this conversation. Actually, Zach will, will continue with that exact point. I have a question uh, about that with cognitive impairment. Um, we're gonna jump over to our networking session that we're gonna be hosting uh, for the next half hour. Um, there's going to be a link that, there it is in the chat. Um, I'd encourage that you attend, so jump over there. There's gonna be a slight delay just in finishing this session and jumping over to the networking meeting. So we'll see you there, just sit tight. Um, and yeah, thanks for joining us. Thanks, everybody.